Tony Gregg was a fantastically versatile all-rounder. He averaged more than 40 in tests when batting and 32 with the ball. He could bowl seam or spin, but he never played for his country of birth, South Africa. Just as he was coming of age as a player, Australia, New Zealand and England had stopped playing his team. So Greg left to go and live in the UK, decades before the term Colpack changed the game forever. And he was good enough to play for and captain England. He was also in the second ODI that was ever played. In the 1970s, limited overs cricket was almost unrecognisable compared to what it is today. The playing kits were white, they used a red ball, and every game was played during the day. And it wasn't even always 50 overs. All of that changed thanks to a man named Kerry Packer. His World Series cricket revolutionised the game. A lot of the features that they introduced at that tournament continue to be a major part of cricket today, including coloured kits and matches played under floodlights at night. So why did Packer do it? Well, he wanted cheap Australian-made TV content and for the game to look better when he watched it on his telly. Although Packer and his family had a huge stake in the Nine Network, they hadn't been able to secure exclusive broadcasting rights to Australian cricket. When the ACB, or Cricket Australia as they're now known, rejected his bids multiple times, the media mogul took matters into his own hands. Packer decided that if he couldn't buy the rights to the broadcast, he'd buy the players instead, and plans were set in motion for an exhibition tournament with global appeal. He managed to sign up some pretty impressive Australian, English, Pakistani, West Indian players, New Zealand players, I mean, kind of players from everywhere. Those included Greg and Ian Chappell, Tony Gregg, Clive Lloyd, and Imran Khan. Even South Africans played despite their nation being banned. Of course, all hell broke loose once the plans were leaked to the media in 1977. The lack of support from the sports governing body or the Australian board meant that World Series cricket had probably a shorter lifespan than it could have had but its legacy has clearly lived on. Kerry Packer went back to normal TV products after that, and sadly the pay he gave the players also regressed. But other things remained, like the white balls and the pyjama clothing. He also used an interesting tactic to get the players involved, and that was not even the only time that Tony Gregg was involved in a Rebel League, because three decades later, he'd be involved in another. If you need a VPN, go Nord. Use nordvpn.com forward slash Kimber to get a two-year contract with a discount plus four extra months plus gifts in some markets. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the show notes. Protect your computer like a blocker protects the stumps with Nord VPN today. By the 2000s, ODI cricket was massive, the biggest format if we're being honest, but T20 cricket was fast moving up on the outside. And the first person to really commercialize this was again a TV station owner. This time it was Subhash Chandra, the founder of Z Telefilms. After a historic World Cup win in 1983, Indian cricket was going into overdrive. In the 90s and 2000s, they began establishing themselves as the most powerful board in the world, certainly the richest. With India's busy schedule, the BCCI got rich very quickly after they unlocked the rights just before the 1996 World Cup. And that wasn't a particularly easy thing for them, having to go to the Supreme Court for the right to sell Indian cricket rights, which until that point had been under a monopoly at Duodarshan, the government network. In fact, before, the BCCI actually had to pay to have their games broadcast. Interest around international cricket was huge in India at that time. So you can imagine, broadcasters were frantic in their search to secure the Indian series. And one of those people was Subhash Chandra, who was happy to dish out some huge money for exclusive broadcasting rights to Indian cricket. Unfortunately for him, the BCCI wasn't quite in favor of handing over the broadcast to Z, even when they were the highest bidder. But Z was still desperate to get into cricket broadcasting. And so Chandra decided to launch the ICL, the Indian Cricket League. And at the same time, the BCCI was pretty unconvinced when it came to T20. Remember, England had introduced the format in 2003, but even when India won the inaugural T20 World Cup in 2007, making them world champions for the first time since 1983, they did so in a format that they didn't actually play at home. At that moment, T20s went from a gimmick to the biggest thing in our game. 
The fact that the BCCI was slow moving and T20 was fast was perfect for an entrepreneur. And so suddenly Chandra seized his opportunity. But there were a couple of hurdles ahead because the BCCI was not about to hand over the reins of an entire format to a private entity, especially one that they wouldn't even sell their existing rights to. They refused to sanction the ICL and branded it as a rebel league. Without the BCCI support, the ICC also refused to acknowledge the legitimacy of the ICL. And with this came threats from many boards around the world that if you went and played in this, that might be the end of your international career. And it was very much unlike the World Series where Kerry Packer was able to sign some of the biggest names in the game. Chandra was left with mostly players who had retired or were close to the end of their career. And this was not ideal because he knew that the big names would be what drew the sponsors in and thereby the money as well. And that's not to say that they didn't have any stars involved. Kapil Dev was the face of the league. Tony Gregg was some kind of czar of the ICL. He joined Dean Jones and Kieran Moray as board members. Damian Martin, Chris Cairns, Inzamal al Haq, Shane Bond, Lance Kluzner, and Michael Bevan were some of the biggest overseas signings. But one of the main reasons the league didn't take off with people was because they couldn't secure a big ticket Indian name, largely because of the BCCI. So with no Tendulkar or Dravid, Ganguly or Sewag to draw in the crowds, it was a kind of doomed enterprise. Kerry Packer's big advantage was that international cricketers were just not making that much money back then. So as soon as he dangled the carrot of riches, or even just like a professional wage, he could pretty much buy whatever player he wanted. And he also ignored the guys he didn't rate, like a one-man selection panel. And for many players, that would translate to being fully professional. Cricketers were happy to secure a deal and find some financial stability in their life. This wasn't quite the case in 2007. Players were already fully, or at least fairly, in some markets professional, and at least most of the players from the major nations were already pretty well paid. But the first season in the ICL went ahead and it was a success in that it existed and people watched it. But it was also a complete mess. There was the ICL 2020 Indian Championship, the ICL's 20s Grand Championship, and perhaps in a tribute to the original World Series, the ICL's 20s World Series. A 50 over competition was also in the works but never quite got off the ground. There just seemed to be an ICL competition on every couple of months and no one was quite sure what any of it meant. And by this time, the BCCI's supposed sabotage was well underway. They were launching their own franchise league, you may have heard of it, the IPL, and they ensured that the walls closed around the ICL. Venues, official sponsors were getting harder and harder to find. There were rumors that if you had anything to do with the ICL, that meant that you would be ignored for life by the BCCI. In fact, Lalit Modi would go on to allege that the BCCI went to the extent of just blacklisting service providers like production companies and commentators and event managers who worked with the ICL. But maybe the biggest blow was actually when the BCCI decided that they would welcome back those who returned from the ICL fold. This meant that a lot of the younger, better players from India who were playing with the ICL, who thought they would have to go off in that league forever, now had a chance to come back and play in the major league. And one of those players you'll know of, because it is Ambadi Raidu. Though he didn't play all that much cricket for India itself, he ended his career as a legend with the IPL, winning five championships across Mumbai Indians and Chennai Super Kings. It wasn't just the players who came back either. Kapil Dev, whose role in the ICL had cost him a position as chairman of the National Cricket Academy, did his best to ease tensions between the BCCI and the league. He claimed that the ICL would not be a rival or competitor to the board, rather that it would help identify young talent who would go on to play for India, kind of framing it like they were doing the BCCI a favour. But eventually he too was forced to turn his back on the ICL and was formally granted amnesty by the BCCI once he cut all of his ties with the Rebel League. But even without the BCCI interference, the ICL had more than enough issues on its own. The most pressing one was the lack of transparency with finances, or sometimes the lack of actually just paying anyone. Details on contracts and advertising revenue were really vague, if you could find them at all, and rumours of fixing were completely rampant. In 2015, former New Zealand batter Lou Vincent admitted that it was the ICL where he first started fixing matches. And fixing clearly never went away but it was louder during the ICL than it had been in a very long time. In some matches, it looked like both teams were in on conflicting fixes. And a player told me that Tony Gregg came screaming into a change room at one point and told everyone just to stop fixing. 
And they also kind of abandoned the franchise idea at a certain point, eventually having games between Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indian, and a World Eleven. The problem with all of that was the quality of the players. Not a single team had a lineup that could compete with their national side. And if we're being honest, the World Eleven was a bunch of players who were famous in the 90s. So after two seasons of four tournaments, with them unable to sign players and other stakeholders, the ICL eventually ceased to exist. And in 2024, it's actually easy to forget that it ever did. Highlights and scorecards are really hard to find. Even searching Indian Cricket League on Google will see more results for the IPL than the Rebel tournament that preceded it. But its impact can't really be denied. It was cricket's first franchise T20 league. And it started us with the silly names and even had the third umpires reviewing each ball. Plus, when the payments were made, the money was really good for domestic cricket, which had never seen pay packets like that before. And that had a direct knock-on effect on how domestic cricketers were paid. Not to mention that over the years, franchise sports in India, and not just cricket we're talking about here, have seen a major boom. While the IPL is credited with revolutionizing sports broadcasting in the country, franchise leagues for volleyball, football, and even kabaddi now exist. And at least part of that credit has to go back to the ICL. Because in its own mad, ugly, disorganized, and anarchic way, it did actually pave the way for franchise leagues in India, but also for athletes to be paid more. But it is really worth remembering here that while Kerry Packer and Subhash Chandra were fans of cricket, they did not start these leagues because they wanted to pay the players better. They did it for their own business reasons. And Tony Gregg was just one of those players, a cricketer trying to get paid for his craft and later trying to keep himself employed, even though Kerry Packer once said he had a job for life at Channel 9. But in many ways, Tony Gregg was the Forrest Gump of cricket. Every single big moment over 50 years where our game changed, he was there. When South Africa went away, when ODIs came, the Packer Revolution, and the ICL experiment, plus pretty much everything else in between. Tony Gregg was a fantastically versatile all-rounder, and maybe also the most rebellious. A lot of people complain that I'm not a former cricketer, and so that I don't really know the game. Well, you know what they can't claim? That I don't know deaths. I've been using deaths for years. I'm a collector of deaths, old and new, and I'm sitting on a new one right now. I'm the Don Bradman of sitting at desks. So when I tell you that the E7 Pro next generation height adjustable desk from FlexiSpot is legit, this is like Michael Jordan talking to you about sneakers. This desk holds 160 kilograms. It is as stable as anything I've ever seen and it has under desk cable management. But really the main skill here is that this desk rises and falls at the push of a button and it moves super quick. And it has so many settings that remember your favorite heights. It really does it all. And I could not recommend the E7 Pro from FlexiSpot anymore, even though I am currently sitting on one of FlexiSpot's BS12 Pro multifunctional adjustable upgraded fabric ergonomic chairs. My butt and computer have never been happier than when using one of FlexiSpot's products. So get over to their page right now for big savings.